Okay, so let's get started. I have a couple announcements this week. Uh, the first is that the lecture next week will be in room 120, and to get there, you just go down the hall over here and down the stairs. There's also an elevator, and it's kind of tucked away in the corner over there. Another thing which I'm very happy to announce is that there will be a, a special guest lecture by Dorian Abbott, December 5th. This is the, the weekend after Thanksgiving. And he'll be talking about how to reconcile climate models with previous conditions, sort of exotic climates on the Earth. I think this will be a really, really neat lecture. <coughs> the thing I'd like to announce is that next week on Tuesday, there will be a talk by Lester Brown at the International House in the Assembly Hall between 6 and 7.30. That's what we're about, sort of broadly about sustainability, so I'd encourage I encourage you, if you're interested, to, to attend. So, the, the topic of the lecture today is fission, and a big part of what I'll be talking about was the first self-sustaining reaction that occurred right down the street here in Chicago. And a fun story to relay about that, that pile was one by a man, Mr. Hilberry, who was a, a safety operator on the pile, and on the day of December 2nd, when the pile went critical, he showed up and they told him that, uh, that if, if he got a certain signal, he should, he should cut a rope. And that rope would cause a cadmium control rod to fall through the pile and shut it down. But at the time, he didn't know why it was called the SCRAM, the, why that was his title. And Possibly because of the secrecy and, 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 and the pace with which the project moved, it wasn't until later they found out that SCRAM stood for the Safety Control Rod Axeman. <laughs> but this was, this was the, I should say, the, the safety of, of last resort, and they, and they never had to use this particular uh, mechanism. So if after today's lecture you're interested to read more about nuclear power, physics, and weapons, there are a number of books that I highly highly recommend. The first is Plutonium by Jeremy Bernstein. Jeremy was on the late stage of the Manhattan Project and later a staff writer at The New Yorker for, for many years. And relevant to, uh, to me, he's also a, a cosmologist and has done a lot of interesting work in that field. Another book which I would highly, highly recommend is Megawatts and Mega Tons by Garwin and Sharpak, The Future of Nuclear Power and Nuclear Weapons. This is a book for the public, but it has a lot of really nice meet without being too technical. I think it's really, it, it's really uh, excellent. If, if you'd like to read more about some of the particulars of nuclear physics that we'll be talking about in this lecture, these two are, are more advanced undergraduate or graduate level physics books, but uh, have, have nice discussions of, of fission. From a historical perspective, I think this article, Experimental Production of a Divergent Chain Reaction by Enrico Fermi is, is truly excellent. So this is based on a 1942 report that was submitted to the Met Lab here, and at the time it was classified, and it, 10 years later became declassified and was published essentially as is. So rather than be, reading like an article, it reads more like a, a lab book. So you get a lot of insight into uh, how, how the pile was constructed and, and, and some of the challenges. So it's really a neat article. Yes. So just for some orientation with respect to the rest of the lectures here, so we've talked about how we get power to us and how we use it. In lecture two, I talked about the synchronous generator, and that's how you go from mechanical to electrical power. In the last lecture, I talked about heat engines, this idea of taking, converting heat into mechanical work. And a particular result there was that there's a limiting efficiency with respect to uh, that conversion process, and that's called the Carnot limit. And it's just the ratio of the, the cold side temperature, the, water, the cold water out here, and then the hot side. And this puts a bound on how much heat you can extract from this, this steam uh, the steam chamber. <coughs> Talked about how gradients can drive heat flows. And the topic of the lecture today will be the reactor itself. And in the context of the rest of the lectures, the reactor is simply a source of heat. And, uh, and the topic today will be the, the physics of that, of that device. In the 
US today, we get something like 20 to 22% of our electricity from nuclear generators. But that varies a lot by region. And this is a slide that I showed a little bit earlier. But you'll see nationwide, at the time the census was taken, it was about 21%. But that coal and natural gas were really the dominant forms of, uh, of primary energy for electricity. But one thing that's very interesting is that in the Chicago area, and you'll find this if you look at, if you're on Tom Edison, you'll find this if you look at your bill, nuclear is something like 62% of the, of the mixture here. So worldwide, nuclear power comprises about 18% of total electricity. Well, that was, that was a few years ago, and today it's more like 14%. But some countries rely very heavily on nuclear power, say Japan, France, I believe Belgium, uh, France is something like 77% nuclear power. One thing that I found really amazing about the development of nuclear power is how rapid it was. I think this it was obviously pushed by a lot of uh, societal <coughs> considerations. So the neutron wasn't discovered until 1932, and by 1938, fission had been correctly identified. It, 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 there had been experiments which had undergone fission, but it wasn't really identified until 1938. And then by 1942, fission was used in a self-sustaining reaction. This was right down the street. And this, and at the time, this was in complete secrecy because this was a wartime effort. And as you know, by 1945, there were unfortunately nuclear weapons. And shortly after that, again in the context of nuclear weapons, fusion was harnessed, and thermonuclear weapons. By 1951, Nuclear power was first used for electricity, and this was really a byproduct of a research reactor, the experimental breeder reactor in Idaho. And Idaho was a field site of the Argonne National Labs. And at the time, you can see it was really a, a fairly small scale generation. One of the first large scale generations was the Alvinsk plant in Russia, and this was a, a weapons production reactor where they decided some, to use some of their waste heat for electricity, and, and they derived about 5 megawatts. The first commercial plant was again a, a, a production's reactor that they decided to use heat from and derive uh, 50 megawatts, and this was Alder Hall in England. The first commercial reactor in the US was the uh, shipping port reactor in, in Pennsylvania. And this was very much the product of Rickover's nuclear navy program. So it was a very, the, the design of the reactor inherited more from that than the, the, than the weapons production reactors. <clears throat> so what's new here, that I would say, yeah, is that today there are about 108 nuclear plants in the, in the US. So, so what is fission? Well, let's go through the steps here. So what happens is that a neutron is absorbed by this uranium-235 nucleus. So what do I mean when I say 235? So this means that it has 235 nucleons. Nucleons either a proton or a neutron. And in the case of uranium, that's 92 protons and 235 minus 92 neutrons. And this becomes this uh, compound state, which is uranium-236. And you notice the, the numbers clicked up one because it has absorbed this neutron. And that undergoes some, some, some oscillations and deformation until eventually it, it splits into two pieces. And these can be widely varied in, 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 in the distribution, but a particular example is 147 lanthanum and 87 bromine. And in this particular reaction, you emit two neutrons, and these little dash lines are meant to represent uh, some, some high energy photons and gamma rays. And one thing that's interesting about this decay is that because this, this nuclear matter is so rich in neutrons for stability, um, the, these, these product nuclei are, are much richer than, than they would, would be naturally. So lanthanum is, is, is 147 is, is highly rich in neutrons. So these, these, uh, these product nuclei decay through, through beta decay and, and emit further radiation. So we can do a fun little exercise, which is to weigh all of the things on this side that go into the fission, and weigh all the things on this side that are the products of the fission. So let's just do that. So a neutron weighs 1.0087 atomic mass units, and that's, that's a unit that's common in, in chemistry. 
Uh, and the, 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 the nucleus here is 235.0439, and the total is, is this number here. Now, if you do that in the reactants, you have the lanthanum and the bromine and the two neutrons. And the total there is 235.8663. And we note that this is less than the, 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 the products, I mean, the reactants, by about 0.2 atomic mass units. And we said, well, why is that? And I think that's the way to see it is that E equals mc squared. And that by this mass falling, that means that that mass, what, what we observe formerly as mass, has been converted into energy, that is, the kinetic energy of these all these particles that are, are, are produced. So well, I'll spend a few slides early on in this lecture to explain some of the units used in nuclear physics because a lot of the things that are, are convenient for us, like joules and kilograms, simply aren't convenient on this scale. So the atomic mass unit on, on scales convenient for us is 1.66 and 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And it's hard to really deal with that just to carry all around, carry, carry all these factors around. And uh, one thing that's very convenient is to define a new mass by inverting this equation. So instead of equals mc squared, you say m is equal to e over c squared. And, and then mass has units of energy per speed of light squared. And I claim that a very convenient unit of energy to use in nuclear problems is the, is the million or the mega electron volt per c squared. And if you were able to attend lecture two, you'll recall that if you have two plates that have some potential difference between them and an electron in that region, that electron will be accelerated from one place to the other. And an electron, well, a million electron volts is the energy, is the kinetic energy of that electron after it's passed through a million volts of potential. And uh, you don't really need to calibrate yourself to have a physical intuition for these units. It's just that they, you'll see that they provide a convenient uh, basis to talk about these processes. So, so another fun thing you can do is say, uh, what is c squared? Now, the speed of light you normally think of as being a velocity, like meters per second, but you can just solve for it here in terms of units of en energy per mass. And in these fun units, the speed of light squared is 931 MeV per atomic mass unit. Okay, so if you, know, if you take this mass difference of 0.2 and you multiply by this conversion, you find that this, this fission process, this particular one here, releases 177. MeV, and that's kind of a nice round, nice round number. Does that first um, <coughs> first uh, reaction where the neutron is absorbed into U two thirty five require any energy in order to make that happen? Do you have to put energy into it? That's a good question. Actually, I have a slide that we'll, we'll talk about that step in a lot more detail because that's really an essential part of understanding the vision. Um, so what is that? Here. So, so as an aside, if you don't happen to believe in antimatter or equals mc squared, there's a really kind of cute system which I think shows you shows you the, the sense of this. So if you plug in the electron mass here and put it in these kind of fun units, the electron mass is 0.5 MeV per c squared. It happens that there's a, an interesting isotope of sodium, sodium-22, which decays through the emission of a positron, which is an anti-electron, so antimatter. And uh, what can happen is that that positron can annihilate with an electron. And in doing so, it completely converts the mass of the positron and the electron into energy. So what happens is that when these things annihilate, they emit two, two photons of radiation. And each of those, if you measure them, just like, just like the way you think of photons of light in this room embodying some energy, if you measure that energy, you find that it's 0.511 MeV. So this tells you that the, the mass of the electron is converted solely into energy, this radiant energy. Now, this is less dramatic in this nuclear example because it's only 0.2 U that you lose relative to 235. So it's not a complete conversion, but in spirit, it's, it's, it's the same type of statement. 
So the second piece of physics I need to introduce before we can talk about more of the nuclear physics here is the idea of a cross-section. So if you would think of a, a window and throwing a, well, a baseball, say accidentally hitting it, and if it's going slowly enough, it'll just bounce off and it won't break the window. Now, if you throw the ball, the ball's going a little bit faster, it might tend to break the window where it's a little bit weaker <coughs> in the middle. But obviously, if the ball's going fast enough, it'll break the, the window wherever it impacts. Okay? So an interesting quantity to plot is the area over which if the impacting ball will break the window. So at low velocity, nowhere on the window will it will cause it to break. So that, that area is zero. And then some sort of critical velocity, that if the ball is going fast enough, it will cause some fraction of the window to break if it hits. And then by the time the ball is going fast enough, anywhere it impacts on the window, it, it, it will cause it to break. So that this quantity becomes the entire window area. Now the notion of a, of a cross-section in, in nuclear physics is, 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 is similar in, 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 in spirit, and it, uh, it quantifies how probable interaction is through an effective area of the impacting object. And, impacted object. and we'll, we'll see some more examples of this that, uh, that, that will clarify the concept. But basically the question you ask is, how big does the nucleus look to the neutron? That is, how readily a neutron will be absorbed by a nucleus depends on kind of how, big, how big it looks. And uh, when you talk about those areas, the nuclei are obviously much smaller than, than, the, than a window. So rather than talking about square centimeters, a convenient unit to use is the barn. And that is 1 times 10 to the minus 24 uh, centimeters squared. So th this, is, this is a characteristic size of a, of a nucleus. OK, so now we have an MeV, which is a nice unit of energy and, and, and mass for, for nuclear systems and, and the barn, which is a nice way to talk about kind of the size of of things. Now, in nuclear systems, uh, a nice way to understand the dynamics is to look at the potential energy surface. And this is kind of an abstract thing, but the way I like to think of this is as just a, as a hill. So there's just some, some hollow in this hill. And if you put a, a ball there, if you give it kind of a kick, it can roll up the hill, but then roll back. But if you give it enough of a kick, it will roll entirely over this hill and then down this much bigger hill. And these nuclei are something similar so that uh, you have to put some energy in to, to stretch them. Or if you put some energy in, they, they stretch and, and oscillate like this. And if you put enough energy in, they, they, they split apart. And uh, this, this energy that you have to put in to kick them over this is the, is the activation energy. And this is a concept that's that's uh, familiar from, from chemistry in some sense. And uh, once you have that, it'll roll down this hill and release the sort of energy scale that I talked about earlier, that 177 MeV. So we can kind of put all these together and, and look at a real nuclear system, and you'll find that this one looks a lot like the ball breaking the window. So on this axis, we plot the cross-section. And again, you don't have to be calibrated to these units. Just think of these as saying something about the characteristic size of the nucleus. And on the x-axis, we have the, the neutron energy. So you see that for low energies, nothing happens. So you think of this as being the effective area over which a, a neutron of this energy will cause the nucleus to, to, to split. You see that by the time you get to a million electron volts, then there is some probability that the nucleus will, will split. And, uh, and you see that, that that sort of behavior looks very much like this, this threshold, which is to say that you have to put some energy in, that the kinetic energy of the neutron, uh, to kick the nucleus over this, this activation to, to fission. OK, so just when we thought this kind of made sense in this physical picture, let's plot an important isotope in, in a nuclear reactor's weapons, which is uranium-235. And the first thing you'll note here is that there is no threshold. That is, uranium-238, you had to have enough kinetic energy to kick it over that hill. But here, uh, something even 
more kind of paradoxical happens, which is that the, the cross section goes up and up and up at low energy. So if you have a very slow neutron, what this is saying is that it's very likely for it to cause the nucleus to split. So this might seem kind of counterintuitive. But what this is telling us is that we need to look more carefully at how we're interpreting the, the physics of, of, of the fission here. So let's, let's go back, following your question, let's go back and, and think about just this first step here. So when the nucleus absorbs this neutron, it becomes a uranium-236, so it's from 235 to 236. And so it's actually the 236 that splits and not the 235. That's the first thing to think about. And again, it's, it, in these uranium nuclei, you need about 6 MeV to, to drive this deformation to fission. Okay, so now the question is, where's that energy coming from if you're, if you see that, if you see that this, this thing always produces the type of fission? Well, we can do the same little mass analysis that we did for the whole process, but just for this first step. Okay, so here, well, we can ask, well, how much does this, this thing right here weigh? Well, it weighs whatever this thing weighs plus the mass of the neutron. So 235 plus neutron, which is 236.0526 atomic mass units. Now, so this is this uranium-236, but I put a star by it because if I have some uranium and I pull out a uranium-236 nucleus and I weigh it, it turns out that it weighs 236.0456. And you'll note that those two are, are, are different. In particular, this one is, is higher, which means that it has some additional energy available to it. And if you put that in, in energy units using that conversion to MeV, that 931 per, per uh, MeV per U, this tells you that the energy that's available is 6.5 MeV. And the energy you need to kind of kick this, this nucleus over this barrier to drive this vision is 6.2 MeV. So this is really kind of neat, and it says that a, uh, a neutron can just be floating, floating along very, very slowly with very little kinetic energy, and just happen to be absorbed by this nucleus. And the change of, of state to this compound nucleus provides enough energy to, to, to kick you over this hill. So you might say, well, why doesn't this happen in uranium-238? Well, again, the 238 is not that, it's not the 238 that, that splits, it's uranium-239. And uh, if you do the same calculation there, the mass difference, you find that you get 4.8 MeV uh, from forming that 239 state. But you need uh, 6.5 MeV to induce the, the fission. So that, for this case, you see that you need to kick in a little bit more of your own kinetic energy to drive the process. And that's why, and, and in fact, taking the difference of those, you need about an ME, a little bit more than MeV. And that's consistent with what you see here, that uh, for 238, you need a little bit more than MeV to, to drive the, the vision. Does anybody have any, any questions about that, that process? Yeah? Um, if you could go back to that sure. slide. So the difference between the mass of ordinary U-236 and the U-236 that results from a neutron. Sure, yeah. Okay, so what accounts for that difference in mass? Is it kinetic energy of the impinging neutron? So in this case, um, is a difference between the how the how the 235 is held together in some sense, and how the 236 is held together. I think that's the, the shortest way of explaining it. That that these that these nuclei are sort of comprised a little bit differently. So does that have is that somehow connected with this the shell theory of the nucleus? The the yeah. So the when you think of the, the level picture, um, <coughs> when you add that additional neutron. You, you now have an even number of them, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 that is that is what gives you the the, part, the diff especially the difference between the two thirty eight and the two thirty five case is, is due to the difference in the sort of shell model picture. But maybe we should talk about that in, in questions. It's really a, <laughs> there are a lot of details there. 
Um, so, great. So, so the, what do you what do you want to do? What's the what's the goal here? Is to have a, a self-sustaining reaction. You can imagine the way to do that is to have a neutron come in and uh, and and split the two thirty five, and that produces some fast neutrons coming out. And those you want to induce further further fissions, and uh, and so on until you have this this, this chain reaction. So as, as we calculated earlier on, the, the energy that's liberated in this in this fission right here is about 200 MeV. And that varies from fission to fission depending on what, what uh, product of the eye you form. If you convert this into more human units, it takes about 31 million fissions to produce a joule of thermal energy. It's about the energy you need to lift an apple through one meter. And uh, now when you think about nuclear power stations, they, they produce a gigawatt, gigawatt scale of thermal power. So that's billions of joules per second. So it's a billion times 31 billion fissions. So it, you're, you're talking about a lot, you're talking about harvesting a lot of these microscopic reactions to get, to get the sort of macroscopic energy that these things produce. So the next thing we need to think about is that uh, is, is the following: is that these neutrons that come off of here, if you measure their energy, it turns out the mean energy is about two MeV. It's kind of funny to convert that to a velocity to see how fast these things are moving. It turns out they're moving two times ten to the seven meters per second. Now the uh, the speed of light is three times ten to the eight meters per second. And so you see that these when these neutrons fly off here, they're moving at a reasonable fraction of the of the speed of light. Um, and, uh, and then on average, you release 2.5. So this, this vision might release 3, and this one might release 2, and 3, and 2. So, so the, this is, you often want to talk about sort of average quantities instead of particular reactions. Um, pardon me. Could, yeah. could you remind us what the speed of light is in uh, uh, meters per second? So it's 3 times 10 to the 8. So this is uh, a significant fraction of that. So now we have kind of a problem, or, or think something you might identify as a problem, which is that if you look at it on this chart, we're emitting neutrons out here. So this is a million electron volts. This is an MeV. So the neutrons we emit have energy out here. And you see that if you want to continue, if you want to drive this, this chain reaction, uh, you, you want these neutrons to produce further fission. And you, and you see that they produce further fission most easily if they're moving much more slowly. So they're just kind of puttering along and, well, <laughs> exactly that. So they, and, they, and they're absorbed by, the, by these nuclei. Um, so what you want to do somehow, or one way of doing this is, is slowing these down to where they're much more readily absorbed. And you'll note that the, the difference there is that at this MEV scale, the cross section is a barn, whereas at these sorts of scales where you want them to reach, the cross section can be a thousand times higher. So you can imagine how that would really uh, facilitate this, uh, this, this chain. So the way you do that is with a moderator. And uh, one way to picture this is imagine a, a table, a full table full of pool balls, and you throw a pool ball in really fast into that table. And, uh, and you, know, you know that if a, a pool ball runs into another one, it can impart a huge fraction of its, of its energy. And uh, you can imagine that by the time this really fast ball reaches the end of the table, it's really given up a lot of its energy to all the other to the balls on the table. So that by the time it goes to the, the end of the table, it's really at a much lower energy. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the kind of principle to apply here. So another aspect of this is that uh, is something you can understand by thinking about a ping pong ball instead of a pool ball. So if you throw a ping pong ball through, it'll just ping 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 ping, ping through through all the through all the through all the say pool balls on this table and uh, give up very little of its energy. So one thing that you want is to have the moderator have a comparable mass or as low as possible mass <coughs> compared to your to your neutron. Um, and with these neutrons, the other thing you want is you don't want the moderator to absorb the neutrons. You know, you want them to 
you want them to continue so they can they can drive this this chain reaction. So if they got absorbed here, they they would no longer be able to do that. So you want the the moderator to have a really low absorption cross section. Okay, so for uh, for the neutron mass, a hydrogen atom is it, it, uh, water is pretty reasonable because you have all these hydrogens and those are just protons and those don't weigh a lot. So what happens is the neutron flies through and bumps into the protons. So that's very effective, but the problem is that protons can also capture the neutrons. So that isn't so good from the second point of view. So a water moderator will absorb a lot of those neutrons. Um, so, so another possibility is to use heavy water or a new range of water. And what you do here is you sort of pre-attach the neutron, or you have neutrons that are pre-attached to the, the proton, so that when you have a neutron fly through, all the protons already have a neutron kind of already stuck to them. And, and, and in, in, in that sort of rough sense, it really reduces the probability that your neutron will get absorbed. Another possibility is to use graphite, and now a carbon atom is pretty heavy, but the thing about the nice about it is that it has a very low cross-section. This was the approach in, in all of the early um, reactors, such as the one here and uh, the weapons production reactors. It's also popular, or at least it was popular, in reactors in England and, and Russia, but not so much in the US. Uh, so, I just want to point out a common mistake, and this is really owing to the fact that mod, uh, uh, moderation is, is, is a bad term for this. So you sometimes hear someone say that moderation slows the fission down, but actually what moderation does is it just slows the neutron down, and that facilitates the fission. So, so that, that's just a little conceptual point. So, so the next question you can ask is, well, how, how cool how much can you slow the neutron down? Well, if the neutron's moving very slowly and uh, it runs into a proton, you have to recall that all the moderator is at some temperature, so it's, it's jiggling around. And if the neutron runs into that uh, and it's moving more slowly, the, the proton can actually give it a kick. So really, the slowest the neutron can become is whatever that sort of characteristic temperature scale the moderator is. And those are called the, the thermal neutrons. So it turns out that that's, that's somewhere around here. So you have a neutron that's really quite fast, and you slow it all the way down to, to sort of uh, this, this type of scale. And what's kind of remarkable about that is it only takes about 100 collisions. So if you imagine, Trying to slow this thing that's going two times ten to seven meters per second down to to a thousand meters per second. You know, if you're actually doing that with pool balls, you might be surprised that it would only take about a hundred collisions to do that. So that's really kind of neat. And that happens over a length of about seventeen centimeters in graphite, uh, six centimeters in heavy water, and seven millimeters in, in water. And uh, this is one of the things that makes light water reactors uh, nice and compact. So, so now we have some of the business out of the way. We can we have a little bit more fun talking about the first self-sustaining reaction here and, 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 and the reactors more generally. So again, this is this very, very neat article, and it gives, I think, a really neat historical perspective on, uh, on some of the considerations of the construction of the pile here. And if you haven't seen the, the sort of monument to it, it's, uh, it's about a block away. And uh, this was formerly in the stands of the Stag Field, where the library is now. And I, I, I was wondering that after the questions today, we could all walk over there and I can take people's pictures and we can discuss or whatever. <laughs> um, so, so what did this thing look like? Well, well, so first of all, I should say that, that Enrico Fermi was a uh, professor here at the time and was the, was the director of the project and, and really a driving force behind, <laughs> behind, many, behind every, every requirement. Although it was, it was, of course, a very large team. Um, and uh, so here's, here's, a, here's the cross section of the pile. And the basic idea is that it's, a, it's an ellipsoid. And it had uh, these, these graphite, 
ultra-high purity graphite bricks, and uh, these sort of baseball-sized spheres of uranium oxide and uranium metal interspersed in this sort of lattice. And uh, just to put some scale to this, this lattice separation is about eight and a quarter inches. So just, just to talk about some more practicalities of this thing, each of those baseball size uh, fuel pseudo spheres weigh about six pounds. There are about 22,000 of them in these holes in the graphite. And uh, about 400 tons of graphite were used in the, in the overall project. And uh, okay, so I already said that it's in this sort of lattice of, of spheres and, and graphite. And there are a total of, of 57 layers. So this is just, this is just one, one, one such layer. And in total, there are 81,000 pounds of uranium oxide and uh, 12,000 pounds of uranium metal. And this is a neat little diagram from their, from their paper showing the, the dye which is used to compress the uranium oxide. And they're able to do a couple hundred of those per day. Uh, so here's the, the geometry of the pile itself. So up to 57 layers, um, 400 inches, uh, 400, 400 centimeters in, in radius, and, uh, and 379, uh, 309 in, in uh, radius. Right? It looks like a diameter, but that's actually a radius, I'm sorry, uh, along this direction. And one thing that's really neat reading this article is that uh, it tells you some of the challenges, and one thing I was surprised by is that they said the greatest challenge was simply finding the materials. And there's really no nuclear industry to speak of, so um, so they had to purchase a lot of graphite from different companies, and a lot of these papers is characterizing those different supplies. So they measured the neutron flux with a, a boron trichloride counter and in indium foils, and um, there are also a number of, of tunnels that went through here where control rods could be placed, and uh, you could monitor the pile. So this idea was that uh, as, as they're building the pile, they would measure the neutron flux in one of those counters. And uh, as, as they got closer to this 57, 57th layer, the flux obviously went, uh, rose, rose very rapidly. And, that, and that's when it reached criticality. So the final re so-called reproduction factor of the neutrons in the pile is 1.0006. And we'll have more to say about that in a future slide, but the idea of the reproduction factor is that a thermal neutron induces fission, and that produces more neutrons, more thermal neutrons eventually that produce fission. And for it to be self-sustaining, you want one thermal neutron in one generation to produce one thermal neutron in the next. If you had it such that one thermal neutron produced two, and then two produced four, you'd see that such a thing would, would very rapidly out of control. So for a for a reactor pile like this, you want this to be about well you want this to be exactly one. So the, the first pile was about 0.5 watts. So if you recall a nuclear reactor today is, is about uh, several gigawatts and uh, so this is quite small. And they did a later test where they reached 200 watts. This is really a, a small apparatus. One thing which is kind of fun which you might not know is that there's a patent on the reactor by Fermi and uh, uh, so and uh, yeah, so, so let's, let's go through a few trajectories of neutrons in this pile to uh, understand what can happen. So the, what you want to have happen is have a neutron that gets thermalized, it goes into another fuel sphere, emit a neutron, go into another fuel sphere, and so on, so you have this chain. But it can also be a case that you emit a, a fast neutron that goes through the graphite and is absorbed in the graphite. So all these, these red paths are, are productive and the green paths Slow down the slow down the uh, the cycle. You can also have things where the neutron will partly slow down, but then get reabsorbed in the uranium two thirty eight of the fuel sphere. And uh, this this path three is kind of like this guy here, where it gets emitted and then just gets stuck in the moderator. You can also have a case where the neutron is emitted and uh, just escaped from the pile, and in that case, it it's sort of taken out of circulation and uh, can't sustain such a reaction. One kind of rare thing which you can have happen is that this fast neutron can be above the threshold of uranium-238 
and produce a, a fission in uranium-238, and then that gives you these additional neutrons sort of for free. Um, so a, a kind of technical point about this is that all those cross-sections I showed you before were for fission, but there's also absorption. And absorption takes the neutrons out of circulation, and you really want to, uh, to avoid it. Um, so, so, so in this case, if you, if, if you plot the absorption in natural, graph, natural uranium and graphite bio, you see there's this really kind of perilous region where, where uranium-238 readily absorbs your neutrons. So the idea of putting the fuel spheres uh, interspersed, well, discrete from the moderator itself, was that you could, by having a pure moderator, you slow the neutron down, so you, you take it from here down to here, without letting it go through this sort of perilous region where it'll almost certainly get uh, get absorbed. So that, 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 that tells you why you, you don't have these discrete fuel spheres. So <clears throat> we can combine these all into sort of uh, an economy or a, a, a cycle. So what happens is you have some thermal neutrons coming in. They cause fission in the 235, and that produce, produces some number of fast neutrons. Now there's that kind of rare process I mentioned in the 238, where you get uh, fissions there, and you get a little 3% a gain in the natural uranium reactor. Um, and then the, these fast neutrons make their way to the moderator, and uh, some fraction, about 10% of those, in, in CP1 say, will uh, be absorbed resonantly in that, in that sort of forest of, of the 238. So you lose some that way. Another 10% will get, will, will, uh, will get stuck in the moderator. And then some number of those will be available for next generation. So what happens is the output then becomes the input for this thing and run in the cycle. And again, the thing you care about is the net number of available neutrons per neutrons you put in. And if that's one, you have a self-sustaining reaction. And that's just the product of all these various terms. So the, the number of fast neutrons you get times the probability they get lost, basically. And this is described in a lot more detail in the captions in the, in the notes. But the, the outcome is that you can get 1.11 uh, in the natural uranium and graphite reactor. And this was the, the kind of uh, design idea of, of, of CP1. Of course, in a real reactor, it's going to be this finite thing, and the neutrons can 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 leak out of it. So the fast neutrons can can zip out, and the and the slow neutrons can kind of diffuse out of the pile. So the, this is why you go from 1.11 to 1.0006 uh, in in the actual CP1. Now you want to control this pile so that. Uh, you know, if you get the cycle where you get more and more neutrons produced, you want to slow down that production. There's some really neat figures from, from the original paper. And uh, basically, they, they, the idea was that they had a single control rod, which was on this little rail that went in a tunnel uh, through the pile. And this was a, a boron-rich steel and, uh, and controlled by these motors. And the thing about boron is that it has a very high cross-section. So it will take those neutrons out of circulation. And that, and that effectively slows or shuts down the pile. Um, now for safety, maybe those motors can not move fast enough, and you want to have a quick response in case this thing runs away. So there they developed a separate thing which had cadmium, which again has a very high absorption cross-section to take the neutrons out of circulation. And there's a, a solenoid which was uh, actuated by the counter. So when the, if, the count, if the neutron counter is past a certain threshold, this would release and be drawn into the pile with the, with the weight. And then there were sort of uh, tertiary safety mechanisms where human operators could really shut down the pile if, if necessary. So a good question is why? So, so here's the, 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 the Trinity test at Los Alamos, 0 0.0016 seconds after detonation. So why didn't CP1 look something like that? 0.0016 seconds after it went critical. Well, the first reason is that in this sort of device, k is equal to two. So this gives you, you know, one thermal neutron gives you two, gives you four, and so on. So you get this geometric runaway. And obviously, you don't want that. Um, 
And in, a, in, in, in CP1, you are much closer to this critical value. But still, if you calculate this, you find that what you do is say, how long does it take for a thermal neutron to induce another fission? It turns out that's about a millisecond. Okay, so if you calculate this for the, the, K, the reproduction factor of the CP1, you find that in 10 seconds, the neutron flux will increase 20,000 fold, just, just naively. And if you count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge increase to deal with. But then if you read in the paper, you find that what actually happened was that once all the cadmium was removed, the intensity doubling time, that is, it just doubled, was one minute. So that was much, much slower. And once the control rod was in place, the time constant was 180 minutes. So that you can see that these are, are, are very different sorts of devices. And uh, a key piece of physics which allowed CP1 to be stable and which allows our reactor today to be stable is that there are delayed neutrons. So the idea is that you get a, a fission product, 87 bromine, like I showed, and this decays with a half-life of about a minute to, a, uh, to this krypton plus a neutron. And, uh, and the idea is that you use those delayed neutrons to complete the, uh, to complete the criticality. And because you have this built-in time constant, um, you, can really, you can really manage the reaction much more readily. But what's neat about this, or what's kind of surprising about this is that these delayed neutrons only comprise about 1% of the neutron cycle. So you're really relying on this kind of little exotic <coughs> population of, of neutrons for the uh, stability. I just want to say a few words about modern day reactors. They're very similar in some ways. Uh, so, as I said, light water, just regular water, is a very good moderator. And uh, the problem is that it absorbs neutrons. So, you really, if, if you want to have a reactor with light water, you need to have enriched uranium. So, in the vast majority, something like 70% of reactors around the world today, you have to use enriched uranium and, and a light water moderator. Could you repeat that? <clears throat> Oh, why, why, why it has to be enriched? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so if you think about it in terms of the, the, the four factor, uh, this guy, um, if it's not, a, so if you have, instead of, a, if you have a, so this, this is for a graphite moderator, if you have a light water moderator, it's going to steal more of your neutrons. And if you want to get uh, a good reproduction factor through this cycle, you need to put more fast neutrons in initially. And the way to do that is to have more uranium-235 in the, in the fuel. Um, but, but people have considered, uh, there's a, a Canadian design which uses heavy water and, and natural uranium. And, uh, and graphite was historically popular, although the Chernobyl design was, was a graphite reactor. And there, there are a number of problems that people identified with those. Um, and again, you, you want to use more on it having rich materials for control. And the generic feature of these is you have to remove a lot of heat, you know, gigawatts of heat. So in, in, in many of the cases, it's just the moderator itself, the water that you use to do that. And this, you also have a, an intense neutron flux, so you want to, uh, you want to protect operators and uh, everybody from that flux, so you, you just put a lot of uh, concrete shielding around the structure. And that, brings it to a to totally safe level for the operators. So one last one calculation I want to give uh, here is that uh, is the burn rate in a regular reactor. So instantaneously they might have 100 tons of fuel, which, which is really a lot. And, uh, and about 33 tons of it per year is consumed. Okay? Now if it's uranium oxide, that only means about 29 tons of actual uranium. And of that uranium, it's maybe enriched to 3.5%, uh, 235. So that means that in a year, you burn about 670 kilograms of uranium-235. Now, if you calculate, if you, if, you, if you run the numbers, you find that a kilogram produces about 82 terajoules. And uh, that burn rate gives you about 2 gigawatts. But one thing that's really maybe a little bit surprising from what I said is that if you go in and measure the thermal power in a reactor, 
you might find that it's more like three gigawatts. So, so what's producing the extra thermal power here? Well, the reason is kind of interesting is that uranium-238 can capture um, neutrons through that resonance region, but then it will transmute through a long, through a relatively long chain to plutonium, which is fissile, and that will be burned in, in these sorts of reactors. And uh, it, it, it can provide something like a third of the total heat. So even though the uranium doesn't naturally have that component, it, it's, uh, it, it, it does by the end of the cycle. And again, recall that because of the Carnot limit, uh, about a third of the thermal energy goes to electrical. So, so three gigawatts thermal become, becomes one gigawatt electrical. So just a, just a very quick statistic is that if you want to think about non-carbon power in the future, Right now, nuclear is about 70%, followed only by hydro. And you see that wind, solar, and geothermal are, are, are significantly lower at the present time. One aspect of nuclear that's not appreciated by a lot of people is that if you look at their licenses over the next 50 years and put that in terms of gigawatts produced, uh, if you want nuclear power to be a part of the, of the mix, you either have to produce, you have to make, uh, or uh, construct, or, or, or relicense reactors where the total power produced by these things will, will drop off to, to nothing. Uh, but, but a big problem is that nuclear reactors, if, you know, if you want to build them, they have a very high capital cost compared to like the combined cycle of gas turbine that I talked about in the last lecture. So just to summarize, you can, you can get sustained reaction because you, you uh, produce uh, 2.5 fast neutrons, and those can Reduce further fission, and uh, you, you need to slow those down in many cases if you want to have a convenient reactor. And you can combine all these physical effects in this four factor sort of formula to find uh, a neutron reproduction factor. And this is described in one note if you want to look at this afterward. Um, and, uh, and it's these delayed neutrons which really give uh, a good measure of control to, uh, to, uh, to civilian nuclear power. And uh, the sort of mantra is that you get a fuel moderator control, heat removal, and containment. Those are the components of reactors today. And they really do provide a significant fraction of our electricity. So I'm happy to ask questions. I, I don't have a good impression myself of, of, of what time to think is realistic for the 
There's so many numbers to look at. Were those two efforts parallel with the pile here and the Manhattan Project? Was there a parallel element to it, or were they really one first and then the other? Uh, my understanding is that um, so Groves uh, was so oversaw oversaw the project, and this this was this was very early on, and I don't know what was actually at was on the site at that time. But very quickly, um, Argonne and, and, and the technology here went to Hamburg for the first time. Yeah. Paint a, a pessimistic picture for nuclear power. Existing facilities will die out with little money to produce new ones. Yeah. So is that what's going to happen, you think? You know? yeah. Not so much about the physics, but about the I think it's very hard to say what the trajectory of nuclear power is. Um, Depends how much people identify it as a way to mitigate carbon uh, emissions. And if, if, uh, if you know, if, if, if uh, on the one hand the public thinks it's an acceptable thing, acceptable path, if on the other hand the nuclear industry can assure the public that there's an acceptable long-term waste solution. Uh, I mean, there are a number of things that could fall into place in, in different ways, I think. Um, but certainly in terms of cost, it's become uh, very cost compared to. Nobody's figured out how to make it. And all these well, the, there are uh, there are some newer reactor designs, um, but, but uh, those, those are also some quite expensive. But there's some hope I think that those will become cheaper. But uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's hard to read. <laughs> yeah. yeah on your previous slide on non-carbon energy sources. Sure. How is wood or waste non-carbon? Uh, so the idea with that one is that. Uh, when it's grown, it takes the carbon out of the atmosphere, and then when it's burned, it puts the carbon back. And there's some subtleties to that, but that's the that's the basic idea. Yep. In your um, final lecture, are you going to hit a little bit on fusion? I just want to talk a little bit about fusion. Yeah, maybe some some of the reactor designs that people are talking about. Okay. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit about Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not a, uh, an easy thing to do and it's uh, eventually dangerous. So yeah. how how do they have this thing going at that speed? I know very, very little about that technology. I mean the only thing I read just kind of hearsay is that uh, the bearing design is is is, is the biggest challenge there. <laughs> that, that's all I all I know. Well the thing that bothers me more than the bearing is the seals because these are uh series of centrifuges so you have one gas going from one to the next to the next to the next. So you have to have a seal there yeah. against that speed and that doesn't leak. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you don't know much more about that. Great, well, we're at uh, 12, so let's wrap up here.